50 of the web show and it finds us back in Dublin to meet up with a cool guy called Googie. That's right, there you go, one of Bono's best mates and uh, it was awesome to uh, sort of have this story come about because I saw the amazing documentary on Googie and his art show in New York that featured Bono on the edge and it was just an awesome look at uh, this guy's story, not only as a great artist but also with the band The Virgin Prunes and of course growing up in Dublin. And so it was fun to email him off his website and he got back to me, which was really cool. And I said, when I'm in Dublin, I'll try and catch up with you. And we managed to do that today, which is pretty cool. But here's a little reminder of the virgin prunes and Googie. He's a fascinating guy and really fun to catch up with. You can see all the information on his website, googie.com. But it was a pretty sort of wet, wild and windy day in Dublin. James and I jumped in the car and made our way out to Googie's place. And uh, James held the camera while he flicked it on. And this is what happened. Red says we're rolling and uh, here in Dublin with Googie. How you doing? Very good. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thanks for your time. We're in your uh, little studio here. And uh, I'd love to know the story of how it all came to be for you. Right. Well, when I was a kid, um, I was crap at absolutely everything uh, except <laughs> drawing and except painting. Um, I was one of ten kids, so you know you got to find something you're good at in a situation like that if you want to get any attention. Um, and the only way I could get it from relations and various visitors was to show them something I had done. Right. Um, and I started getting a little bit of attention that way, and. You know, I guess it was just in me. It's always been my passion. It's always been one of the very few things I'm any use at. And uh, I can't, you know, but I mean, I, I, when I was a kid, uh, it was drummed into me by, I, I suppose, to an extent, parents and family trying to give you the right advice because they came from a very different time you know, than we did. I mean, we grew up in the 60s and the 70s here in Dublin. And nobody had anything back then. Yeah. Um, and it was just some kind of a sec secure job, some way of putting something on the table um, for when you were rearing a family. So I was told that there's absolutely no way you can earn a living by, uh, by painting. That's just not something that, that can happen. Um, I was told, you know, I was crap at everything in school, except I had a basic understanding of mathematics. So I was told if I worked very hard one day, I may be able to be a petrol pump attendant. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, this is, this is my work and my life, and I can't believe my luck, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, it must be a pretty good feeling, even looking back to knowing that you're right to follow the dream and the passion, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe I, I drew and I painted, you know, for so many years, and even when I wasn't, you know, I was in a punk band Virgin Prunes for, for about eight or nine years in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but I always would look at something and I, al I always saw it as a painter. My hand was always going as if I was drawing, trying to work things out. And I think I got better even for the few years that I wasn't really doing much paint-wise. Um, so yeah, it's a great feeling. So if you don't mind me asking, like, what was it like growing up in this area? I mean, I'm always fascinated. It seems to me a bit of a harsh place for a young kid to grow up around sort of Dublin and the streets around here. Yeah, well, when you say this area, uh, this isn't the area that I grew up in. I grew up between two... Um, I grew up in, uh, on a road called Cedarwood Road on the north side of Dublin. Um, Finglas was one side and Ballymun was the other side. So when we went to our street, whether we turned left or right, we got beaten up. Um, there was, well, not all the time, <laughs> but uh, we got fairly good at avoiding it. But, right. but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's what it was like. You know, nobody, as I remember, um, had anything. There were so many discussions in our family. Um, we did have a private house, um, but you know, in in a working class area. I suppose we were upper working class, uh, if you want to put it that way. But my folks had 10 kids to feed, um, so, so it was a struggle. And uh, I remember that time, even though in some regard I had a, a very happy childhood, but I do remember it as nobody had much, you know. 
Okay. And so I was reading something about Lipton Village, and then I always get fascinated by people having dreams and following them like yourself when you're younger with painting. How did the Lipton Village thing come around? It was like an imaginary world you created at some stage, wasn't it? Yeah, I suppose it was the way we coined um, our escapism route. Um, you know, we grew up, myself and my mates, when we were kids, everybody played the Gaelic games or soccer. It was a rarity to come across anybody that didn't do one or the other of these two things. Um, we didn't like anything to do with uh, kicking balls, um, <laughs> hurling or any of that kind of stuff. Right. And, you know, I guess we just, yeah, invented invented this little world. It was, I think it started off with, you know, some of the early signs would have been we were fascinated by the idea of finding a word that sounds the way somebody looks. So you look at somebody and you find a word that sounds the way they look. It will describe them in some way, even though it's verbal. And that's where we, uh, that's where we all got our names from. We were given them by each other. Um, I wanted to be a painter when I grew up. My mate wanted to be a singer in a band. And uh, he called me Googie. Okay. Has it been years looking back where you've thought maybe that's been different? You think maybe I wasn't a Googie or has it always been Googie was the right fit even back then? No, uh, I knew it was that I was very freaked by the name and I really pleaded with my mates not to, uh, not to call me that on front of girls <laughs> because... Uh, I was shy anyway when it came to girls and coming out with such a ridiculous sounding word that you knew you looked like uh, didn't do anything for the confidence but um, but no I knew it was me I mean that, that's that's what was so freaky that's awesome, man. <laughs> I knew it was me okay now with your art and stuff for you like I love asking people about their careers and, and say magic moments in their careers or top moments what for you so far has been a magic moment of you I'm sure you've had a few but what's what's like a top one for you well, I suppose I'd have to think right back to where I decided at one point in time that I was never going to do anything else other than paint. And I'd worked for, I guess, three or four years just painting, not doing anything else, going further and further into debt, um, trying to borrow left, right and centre from people, not knowing, you know, I was at this stage, I was with a girl, she was pregnant, we had the baby. Um, and I think a top moment was after, I never sold anything, but then people didn't know about my work, but I did have this huge belief while I had little confidence regarding anything. I really deep down believed that I had an incredibly special gift yeah. that I was gonna have to develop. Um, and I used to do heads and maybe a continuation in some way of what I was just talking about. Yeah. I was fascinated by heads and the way they looked. So I was doing, taking people's heads that I admired, not so much that I even admired their career, I just admired their head. Interesting. And I would paint these, I guess, in a semi-abstract way that would maybe say something more than a photograph, or at least something different than a photograph. So I had accumulated maybe four paintings that I really believed were strong. And I brought them to, uh, so my wife had been with a gallery called the Carlin Gallery and I had got in by the skin of my teeth for a group show and it was going to be a fairly decent group show. This was going to be the first time I got one of these heads in um, and they said, look, we're going to hang one of your paintings. You can drop over an extra one if you like. We may hang two, but we'll definitely hang one. So I took my four strongest paintings in the hopes that they'd pick two and I dropped them over. They were leaning against the wall, um, they were being hung. I think the opening was to be the following evening. Um, somebody had come in with tea and forgot to lock the door after them and some man wandered in and all of the paintings belonging to all of the artists were just leaning up against the walls. Mine hadn't been hung or put away, so the four of them were there. Um, and he got one of the assistants and said, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be here tomorrow. I wanted to have a quick look. Tell me about these. Um, and it was my work, and it, it was the actor Richard Harris, and, uh, and he bought the four of them. Hey! Hey!